Yeah, what are your thoughts on, on January 6th? We're, we're at the anniversary. What happened? Why, why did it happen? I think that there were so many signs mm -hmm. that were being ignored mm -hmm. by those who had the power to prevent it or, or to address it directly. I think what's been most overwhelming about the testimony and the evidence that's come before the, the select committee in Congress is the fact that there were so many warnings that so many different law enforcement agencies were sharing those warnings and yet none of the precautions taken in previous public protests, et cetera, were, t were taken at this particular one, which makes it appear deliberate. Hmm. It was a deliberate decision to ignore those signs and to prepare. Tell me about the signs that you saw, because clearly not everyone saw the signs. That's true. And we can't come to agreement as to what happened and if we can even believe our very eyes. So what signs did you see hmm. and what dangers are they pointing to? Well, we have produced a great timeline mm -hmm. of events that we at the Southern Poverty Law Center use as our measure of the, the flags, the red flags that were coming up. There's no question that we saw signs throughout the year of extremist and hate groups mm -hmm. preparing for the elections and then galvanizing mm -hmm. their supporters mm -hmm. to protest the outcomes of the elections. We saw the organizing of militias in Michigan. We saw the protests on the streets of Oregon. And there was so much chatter on social media. Now you're right, if you don't look for that sort of thing, you might not have been aware. But for law enforcement agencies who are looking for reports of organizing and protests and potential violence, there were flags on every social media platform. Right, no, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, of course, they're no different than the Southern Poverty Law Center. We've been tracking and monitoring this kind of extremist activities for uh, for years. Mm -hmm. And it was a slow, I see it as a slow build up. Yeah. It was all kind of set up to culminate, like January 6th was a real inflection point, right? But there was it was prepared. It was all the, the, the it was like the way the path was cleared right. to set up for this this lie that um, the election, about the uh, undermining the integrity of the election. So that didn't become a speaking point on January 6th, but it felt to me like as soon as it became kind of clear, people were hopeful that, some people were hopeful, that Biden was going to win the election, then things began to be put into place to undermine the election results before it even happened. You know, one of the things that really surprised me is that some of Trump's supporters started talking about the big steal yes. of the election months before the election. Yes. I mean, there, there hadn't been any votes at that yes. point. And so the narrative that you've just described that really built up mm -hmm. over the course of several months mm -hmm. very clearly was planned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the other piece of this. This was not, I think many... Law enforcement agencies might have assumed that this was a spontaneous kind of response, and I don't think it was. And I think that's what the select committee is going to determine, is that in fact, this was planned, there was coordination, there were a lot of fingers involved, and the outcome was the violence that we saw a year ago. The work that, that our colleagues have done in, this, in the Intelligence Project to uncover just how people got mm -hmm. there, as you said, I mean, holding on to that point, that it was planned right. and that it was deliberate and it was all meant to culminate on January 6th when Congress was supposed to certify the election. It's not, we have to remember, it wasn't a random date. So people had time to plan and organize. You're right. There were stop the steal um, rallies that were, that were becoming more and more boisterous animated, I don't know, they, they didn't become violent because they were just themselves organizing, right? But it was clear, it was a clear message. There were buses organized from Alabama to bring people to the Capitol to contest um, the election. I had been calling this whole thing, the January 6th thing, um, an insurrection. I remember watching it. I couldn't even believe my eyes. I just, I just couldn't, I, 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 it's like yesterday, I'm like, I could not believe what I was watching. But now, kind of a year out and reading kind of the work of our colleagues and other folks across the, the sector, 
it really was an unsuccessful coup. And I think that we have to look at it that way. It's, it's, we talk about the threat to our democracy, and I think that it's important to speak about it using the same kind of terms in the same lens that with which we view foreign um, um, attempts to overthrow democracy in a foreign land. The same thing happened here. Someone who was in elected office was trying to figure out a way to stay in office after he lost and galvanized all the support because that's who the people were who came to January. So we support you, we believe you, and you should stay in office. That is, that's an attempt to overthrow the government, Margaret. That, like, yes, did you ever think that that would happen? I mean, you're, you have a, a tremendous human rights background. Did you ever think that that would happen here in the U.S.? No, I honestly didn't. Hmm. I really believed that the foundations of our democracy were stronger. Hmm. And I have to say, I, I've been surprised and relieved to see so many elections officials from both parties who did the right thing, mm -hmm. who stood by the count that they made, even if they personally disagreed mm -hmm. with, with the outcome, and who, for me, really stood for what democracy is in this country. Mm -hmm. It's everyday people who have jobs participating in our democratic processes and who do the right thing, the honest thing, even if it's not their, their top choice. So that's a silver lining, mm -hmm. that there were so many people willing to stand up for what was right on the other hand, what was so alarming mm. were the threats against yes. those people. So many elections officials uh, across the country have actually had their lives threatened, sure. their jobs threatened. Many of them have resigned mm -hmm. or been pushed out. And so we're, we're actually not in the same place as we go into another election season mm. this year, mm. where we have a lot of elections officials who are really worried about whether doing their job puts them or their families at risk. And, and I want to back into that a little bit, Margaret. Like, you said that you thought that the pillars of our democracy were stronger. What, what went wrong? What happened? What, how did we get here? I think there's probably a lot of factors in this. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something I've been reading a lot about. I'm, I'm looking for answers like so many others in the mm -hmm. country. I think social media and the reliance of so many people on news sources that mm. aren't shared mm. widely has created this dichotomy of perspective on what's happened. There's, there's almost two narratives out there. The narrative that so-called mainstream media is covering that is backed up with data and evidence and interviews and et cetera. And then there's the opinion mm -hmm. media, media that only offers news that fits within the frame that they're promoting. Mm -hmm. And because we have so many different sources of media today, people can choose whether or not they want to buy into one frame or the other. And then all of the information that they see feeds that perspective. Mm -hmm. But it, it makes, it makes cross-communication over the divides of that media source really difficult. Mm -hmm. For those of us who might read um, our regular newspapers, we don't understand where this other perspective is coming from. And I think vice versa, maybe people who are listening to talk radio shows don't understand where our information is mm -hmm. coming from. So I think that's a big factor. Mm -hmm. But I think we also have to talk about the political ideologies that are at play. Maybe I'd love to hear your thoughts, Leisha, on what you think the biggest risks are now to our democracy. And and whether or not we're sliding toward something more more frightening, perhaps more authoritarian. I think we're definitely on the path to authoritarian rule. And the thing about it, it it's been consistent with authoritarian leaders uh, across the globe, is that they're proud of it. I mean, and they act in an authoritarian fashion, and people just fall in line and, and follow suit. I read that uh, former President Trump just endorsed Orban. Reminds me of his relationship with, with the North Korean leader. I mean, and Putin. Putin, just the, the lot of it. I'm, I'm completely clear on what he's doing and why authoritarian leaders um, 
appreciate being in that position. It's a position of adulation. People love them. They get to do what they want to do. Okay, that sounds great. But how is it that people who, who have participated in a democracy, how is it that they get, they get to the point where they give up on the democracy to follow an authoritarian leader? That's where I'm, I'm a little bit stuck. None of it makes sense in terms of what I thought was political ideology. Now it's, it's informed by the opinions that you pick up and, and, and believe and, and, and carry out. Well, Leisha, let's talk a little bit about accountability. Mm -hmm. And the people who are responsible, there are more than 700 people who've been charged. Um, I think 150 have now pled guilty. Mm -hmm. How about, though, the people who encouraged and supported and called for those, those protesters and those insurrectionists to take action? Do you think that the process that's underway right now in Congress will hold those folks to account? In a, in a, in a functioning democracy, you would not have your democratically elected officials being the ones who are pulling the strings and inviting the people to 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 participate in the overthrow of their government and then leaving them there. They're the ones that, that you mentioned that have been found guilty and some people are going to serve time and there'll probably be no accountability for, for the elected officials. I appreciate the select committee um, doing conducting their due diligence and not giving up. I think it's important whether or not people listen or um, um, or people are ultimately held accountable, I think it's important to set the record straight. And so as long as, as, as the truth is put out in the public square for consumption, it will remain there. So that's important. But I'm not, I'm not at all hopeful because we've already begun this, this, this spin of, around what happened. Our elected officials are the ones that are saying, oh, it wasn't that bad, it wasn't, it wasn't that bad. Um, you know, co-signing on the former president's um, account of, of, mm -hmm. of what happened. Oh, it was just visitors, just tourists. It was, oh, people were, you know, engaged in patriots and they were, you know, they, they're, they're, they're good folk, you know, kind of like the Unite the Riot rally. So, no, I don't think there'll be any accountability there. Um, I think that it's important for Capitol Police. I know that they recently, they put out a report yesterday or today. I think that it's it's completely ironic and sad that these same elected officials, Republicans mostly, who purport to support law enforcement, left Capitol Police, you know, to to fend for themselves. And you know, five, five, three. I think we lost three or four um, officers, and they, they, they're not standing up for them, but but they seem to be intent on seeking justice and accountability. So I think that it's all very important. Ultimately, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I think the ultimate measure of accountability in a democracy is whether people get reelected. Ah, good point. And so I think for us, the key is what happens in this year's elections, in the elections in 2024, and beyond, and that means that the emphasis on voting rights is more important than ever. We need everyone to be able to exercise those rights, to speak freely, to choose the candidate that best reflects their values. And we need people to be able to participate actively in the elections in the next few years and not be restricted by some of these false efforts by state governments that are actually restricting access to the ballot box. So. I'm going to stay a little more optimistic that the accountability is going to come from voters voting out those members of Congress who have clearly violated their oath of office. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we can support them to do that here at Southern Poverty Law Center by working with our partners to ensure that the protection of the right to vote is extended across all of our states. That does give me hope. And it reminds me that a functioning democracy requires the participation of all its people. So it's part of the work of the Southern yeah. Poverty Law Center to clear the way for so, so that people can participate in our democracy. Those, and I'm talking about those who have, have been marginalized historically. 
And that's the work, that's the work of the center. And I know, you're right, I know that the will of the people will prevail. We just have to overcome these, these roadblocks and these landmines that would keep us from being able to do it. And maybe ultimately, and I do believe this kind of, that this is what this is all about. Like, this is a last gasp of, you know, white supremacist breath. Like, they know that they're about to lose it all and trying to hold on to power just a little bit longer. It's desperation. Yep. And it makes it really challenging at the moment. Yep. But we are going to succeed. Yeah. Thank you.